Thank you so much. Hi, guys. <laughs> Welcome to Google. Thank you so much for having me. So I loved the book. The book opens, actually, with something I did myself in college, which is that I went to The Price is Right. No way. I, I did. did not know that. I did. And I didn't get on The Price is Right. I actually, uh, my friend got the door prize, and that was as close as we came. But you, wow. you made it on The Price is Right. Yeah. And that's a big, uh, the impetus for a lot of what happens to you after. So I'm just curious, if you were so good at hacking the prices right, why don't you do this with other game shows? Well, I actually have something very funny this year that I haven't talked about much. Okay. So after the whole book journey, and this is like last year, I realized you know, the book tour's coming up and I needed some money to fund the book tour. So a couple friends of mine, got a message that a game show, a brand new game show is filming like 10, 15 minutes from where we live. And it was, we checked online and the final tickets were for the next morning at 6 a.m. So we canceled our plans the next morning, showed up, we used the same Price is Right strategy, and four hours later, I walked away with a brand new car. <laughs> And sold the car, and that helped fund the book tour. So, may <laughs> so maybe your next book should be about how to hack onto uh, national television shows where you can win money. It's worked out pretty well, kind two for like two so far. <laughs> so, so you um, you stopped out of college. You were you were at USC, and you talked about the idea of a dream university, and that's sort of you mm. know why you interviewed a lot of these people. How do you feel about alternative education and you know taking a nonlinear path? So I had, you know, two different things pulling at me when I started college. So this whole journey started when I was 18. I was a freshman in college, and I was spending every day lying on my dorm room bed, staring up at the ceiling. And to understand why I was going through that life crisis, you have to understand that I'm the son of Jewish immigrants, which pretty much means I came out of the womb, my mom cradled me in her arms, and then she stamped MD on my ass and sent me on my way. And, you know, in third grade, I wore scrubs to school for Halloween. I went to pre-med summer camp, studied for the SATs. And by the time I got to college, I'm the pre-med of pre-meds. And, you know, that was the goal. You know, work as hard as you can in high school and you get to college. But very quickly, I remember lying on this dorm room bed, looking over at this towering stack of biology books, feeling like they were sucking the life out of me. Mm -hmm. So at first I assumed maybe I'm just being lazy. But then I began to wonder, maybe I'm not on my path. Maybe I'm on a path somebody placed me on and I'm just rolling down. So, you know, we, when we go back to the idea of, you know, traditional universities versus a nonlinear one, yeah. I wasn't finding the answers I was looking for in traditional classes. So I just did what I thought was natural. I just started Googling it. And you know, I started Googling it and I started going through business books and biographies and self-help books. But eventually I was left empty-handed. Because what I was looking for is I wanted to figure out when nobody knew their name, when nobody would take their meetings, how did they find a way to break through? How did Gates sell his first piece of software out of his dorm room when nobody knew his name? Mm -hmm. How did Spielberg become the youngest studio director in Hollywood history when he was rejected from film school? So to me, I actually don't think they contradict. Being in a traditional university and taking a nonlinear education can actually go hand to hand. For me, I made my own hybrid. I was in school and I went to go find the answers myself. And what I've learned is that when you take your education into your own hands, that's when you actually start going on the path that's gonna change your life. That's awesome. And I think that's great advice to sort of have both and uh, weave them together. So, so this is sort of my take on the book a little bit. The okay. third door, you almost use your own third door framework to create this book. So it's kind of meta because you're talking about <laughs> how all of these um, you know, major powerful people use mm -hmm. the third door, but you yourself kind of had to use a third door to find them. Is that sort of how you envision this book? Because that's the journey that I sort of saw when I was reading it. It's a good insight, and I didn't even realize that until I was looking back on the book in hindsight. So the whole premise and thesis of the book is that after spending seven years tracking down the world's most successful people, you know, when I had started, I had no, you know, 
zero desire to find that one key to success. You know, we've all seen those TED Talks or business books, and normally I just roll my eyes. But what I ended up realizing is that every single one of these people treats life and business and success the exact same way. And the analogy that came to me is that it's sort of like getting into a nightclub. There's always three ways in. There's the first door, the main entrance, where the line curves around the block, where 99% of people wait around hoping to get in. And then there's the second door, the VIP entrance, where the billionaires and celebrities go through. And what school and society never talk about, you know, they always make you feel you either, you either have to be born into it or you wait your turn like everybody else. Yeah. But what I've learned is that there's always, always the third door. Yeah. And it's the entrance where you jump out of line, run down the alley, bang on the door a hundred times, crack open the window, go through the kitchen, there's always a way in. And what I've realized is that not only did all these people who I interviewed take the third door yeah. when it came to launching their own careers, I had no choice but to do it too, because to my surprise, Bill Gates doesn't do interviews with random 19-year-olds. <laughs> so that's why it took this long process of running down the alley, getting muddy, getting bruised up to make it happen. Awesome. Well, to me, you epitomize the third door um, theory. So one of the things that I sort of took away is I'm often reaching out to people and punching over my weight a little bit in terms of who you reach out to. And one thing that's amazing is, you know, your ability to find these people, get them to respond. Um, Tim Ferriss is a great example who teaches you a little bit about reaching out. So I was wondering if you could share some insights with us about how to reach out to busy people. And if you do actually get to them, do you find that people actually are decently responsive? Yes. So one of the people who gave me one of the most practical pieces of advice on this journey was Tim Ferriss, the author of The 4-Hour Workweek. Who's and been in here to do talks, by the way. Well, he's, <laughs> he's incredible. And with Tim, I, you know, I was 19 years old. I ended up having, a, as you know, I crouched in a bathroom at a conference for 30 minutes waiting to jump out to meet him, and I eventually got the interview. And what I learned with Tim Ferriss is that he started his career essentially using cold emails. He emailed the CEO of a company he wanted to work with 32 times until he got the job. And then when he wanted to become an author, he cold emailed best-selling authors for advice. So when I was interviewing him, I naturally had to press him on his cold email secrets. Yeah. And he gave me a template that works unbelievably well. And it goes like, if any of you guys are curious, it goes like this. Dear so-and-so, I know you're incredibly busy and you get a lot of emails, so this will only take 60 seconds to read. And then you put in the next paragraph one to two sentences max of who you are and what context you have that's relevant to the person. And then next paragraph, one to two sentences max again mm -hmm. of a very specific question they can answer right away. You know, what book do you recommend a first-time author? What advice do you have for someone who want, who's new to managing teams? And then the closing paragraph is the clincher. <laughs> I totally understand if you're too busy to reply. Even a one or two line response will completely make my day. All the best, Tim. And what's been remarkable about that cold email template is I've gotten interviews for the book using it, I've gotten mentors, <laughs> pretty much the whole book launch was brought to you by that cold email template. And like you said, it is remarkable that when you are thoughtful about how you message someone, People are really receptive to helping. Because there's nothing worse than getting a really long email, especially right. if you're an important person. But the long essay life story emails. What yeah. you found is if you, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get, right? Mm. So, you know, it's a little bit of a, a numbers game. But I think that's awesome advice and something I I definitely took um, took with me. So you talk a lot about mentorship too. Um, and you were mentored um, by Elliot Biznow from Summit mm -hmm. Series. And I was sort of wondering if you are now a mentor, having the success that you've had, and how mentorship has, has changed your vision. So what I've learned about mentorship is, you know, when you study the world's most successful people in any industry, you can look at finance with Warren Buffett. His entire career changed when he got mentored by Benjamin Graham. You know, you can go any, you know, to any single person who I've researched and interviewed, yep. and there's always been a mentor who's changed the entire course of someone's trajectory. Yep. <laughs> and what I've learned about mentorship is that the most powerful thing a mentor can do for someone, 
you know, of course, there's introductions and opening doors and advice, but at the end of the day, what I've learned is that a mentor can change what the mentee believes is possible. And what I've learned is that you can give someone all the best tools and tactics in the world, and their life can still feel stuck. But if you change what someone believes is possible, they'll never be the same. And that's the most powerful thing a mentor can do. That's what I'm trying to do now that I'm the book's out and I'm yeah. helping out others. That's awesome. You gotta find your one mentee who you can really mold, right? <laughs> Anybody. Um, so I'm interviewing you about an interview you did with Larry King, who you interviewed. So this is very meta because there's a lot of interviews <laughs> very meta. here. What was that like to you? You interviewed Larry King for the book. Um, you met him at Nate and Al's, right? Which is one of my favorite places uh, in LA. And then he interviews you about your book. Um, what was that like to, to have that happen? Well, Sorry. you have to understand the context of this. The whole way I met Larry King is I was sitting on the sidewalk. And talk about meta. I'm sitting on the sidewalk with one of my best friends. This is after the eight-month quest to get to Warren Buffett, and it ends in a complete disaster. And I'm sitting on the sidewalk, completely depleted. And I'm complaining to my friend about how hard not only it is to get interviews, but even when I was doing interviews, they weren't going the way I wanted. And as I'm complaining, a car pulls up and out walks Larry King. And I end up chasing him through the grocery store. And you know, instead of a restraining order, he ends up inviting me to breakfast. And at breakfast, not only do we become, become friendly, we end up doing an interview, and I've been to breakfast with him over 50 times over the past five years. And it gets fully full circle when the book came out and he was the first interview I did for the book tour. So it was truly a remarkable experience. And the one thing Larry has taught me, the secret of interviewing, and it doesn't matter good, if you're doing- good for me right now. Yeah, if you're, okay, ready? So, and you're already doing it, by the way. <laughs> With, whether you know it or not. And it doesn't matter if you're interviewing someone for press or if you're interviewing a job candidate. This is the key. You know, Larry looked at me and he has that gruff, you know, Brooklyn voice and he's like, the problem that you kids have. You know, and he's telling me that all these young interviewers make a monumental mistake from the very beginning. He said the thing they do is they look at all the interviewers they admire whether it's Larry or Oprah Winfrey or Barbara Walters, and they look at their styles and they try to emulate it. You know, it's a natural thing to do. And Larry said that's the biggest mistake you make because you don't know why those styles exist. You know, Larry likes to ask the simple questions everybody's curious about. Oprah uses all this enthusiasm. Barbara Walters is very strategic. Larry said, if you're focusing on the style, you're missing the point. The reason each person has that style is that that is what makes them most comfortable in their seat. And when you're comfortable in your seat, the interviewee is comfortable in their seat, and that's what makes for the best interview. I think that's awesome. That's great, great advice for, for those of us who interview and you know, in all sorts of different contexts. Yeah. So, so you've heard from Larry, obviously. Have you heard from other folks that you interviewed and what was their response to the book? It's been really fun. One of the most fulfilling ones for me is, you know, one of the most surprising interviews was with Quincy Jones. Yep. You know, I knew what most people know about Quincy Jones. I knew he's the most, you know, nominated music producer in history and he's, you know, shaped entertainment over the past 50 years. But he's the only interview where I walked in one person and I walked out another. And, you know, I ended up spending two and a half hours in his house and even the chapter itself, I still read sometimes weekly just to like refill myself with inspiration. And, you know, when the book was about to come out, we had the early galley copies and I got a message. You know, I, I sent the galleys to everyone who's in the book mm -hmm. and I got a message not from Quincy, I got a message from someone who works at his company, like a random cold message saying, hey, wanted to let you know I work for Quincy Jones Productions and I love your book. And I'm like, how did you get my book? Because this is before it was on sale. And he goes, oh, Quincy's been walking around the office handing your book person to person 
saying, this kid's up next. You got to read this. And to my surprise, Quincy read the entire book in three days. And to get that kind of, you know, I didn't write the book for him. I wrote it for the reader. You didn't? You know, I wrote it for the reader. But still, you know, he's one of my heroes. And the fact that it resonated with him. Maybe he reads so his own special. inspirational words every week, too, to sort of refresh himself. No, that's great. That's awesome. And it is a testimony to, to the power of, of this book. So, so I think one thing that I thought was difficult, probably, when I, was, when I was reading it is a lot of the people who you interviewed already have sort of extensive biographies. Mm -hmm. They already have a lot of literature, videos, all of these resources where you can find out about them. What did you feel like you had to add to that conversation and how challenging was that to sort of add to what already exists about, you know, Jane Goodall and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett? So that's a great question because that actually is, was the hardest part of the interviews. I didn't anticipate it, but when you're going in to interview Bill Gates, you can't, well, look, you can take an interview however you want. I knew that if I only have one hour with him, I wanted to make sure that I got the most value out of that hour and ask him questions he's never been asked before. And to make sure you don't ask anything that's been asked before, you have to read everything <laughs> about it. And you know, his biography is 800 pages long and there's hundreds of articles and interviews. So before every major interview, I spent anywhere from three weeks to three months wow. fully immersing myself in each person. And what I've learned is that the most powerful insights from every interview came from a question that even the interview subject didn't know the answer to initially, where they had to go within themselves and think. And those are the moments, whether it was with Bill Gates talking about his negotiations in Japan, or if it was you know, Jane Goodall talking about when her mentor started making sexual advances, when you get someone to look within themselves, that's when you get something new, and that is what's powerful in the end. And you got really, really good at that. But I think you know what you're saying, which is important, is that you did a lot of research and preparation. Because when you only have a finite amount of time with someone, you want to make sure you have that focus there. Ninety percent. Exactly. Ninety percent of an interview happens before you walk into the room. It's about how well you know the person, how comfortable you're feeling about the topic area. And when you're in there, if you're fully prepared, you can completely relax and magic will happen. That's awesome. Cool. Well, I hope I know enough about this book to sort of um, make it worth your while. So um, you talk about low points in the book. Um, we've talked about some challenges, but you you had some, you know, you talked about Larry King, King just now coming off of Warren Buffett, personal, you know, Tra uh, traumas that were happening. How how did you get past that and say, I'm not going to give up on this book. I'm This book's important to me. It's going to happen. I think one of the hardest parts, not only if you're writing a book, but if you're going out to start anything new, whether it's a company or whether it's a new project within an organization, the very aspect of starting something new inherently has tremendous amount of rejections built in. You know, if you're not getting rejected, you're not trying something ambitious. And the wilder the idea, the more you're gonna get rejected. Yeah. And to my surprise, 90% of this journey was me getting <laughs> door slammed in my face. And it got to the point, let's say with Warren Buffett, yeah. where I spent eight months writing him letters and calling his office, and week after week after week getting a no. And you have to understand, I had left school. I'm working full time from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. My only job is asking Warren Buffett for an interview. And you know, month three, it gets a pr pretty depressing. By month six of that's the only thing you're doing, it gets to the point where your insides are black and blue and it feels like you're gonna cough up blood. And what I've learned at the darkest points where there was no hope in sight, is that two things saved this mission. The first is that, you guys remember the movie Castaway? By show of hands, who remembers the movie Castaway? Okay, perfect. So remember, Tom Hanks is on the island and he has the, the volleyball Wilson. 
There have been many points in this journey where I felt I was Tom Hanks on that island. And no phone, no communication, completely alone. And my Wilson, the volleyball I would talk to, would be the core reason why I had started this journey in the first place. And I had a belief in the very Did beginning. Did you have a real volleyball? <laughs> no, <laughs> but it would be in my head. It would, it would, okay. These conversations would be in my head. You know, when you're doing something new, you learn you, your best friend or the voice in your head. And I just believe from the very beginning that if all these people came together, you know, not to promote anything, not for press, but really just to share their best wisdom with the next generation, young people can do so much more. And at the points I wanted to give up, because my life was miserable on this process, I realized this isn't about me. And it was holding on to that idea. It didn't re-energize me and make me say, this is awesome. It just helped me not let go. And the second thing that I think is grossly underrated, especially now in 2018, you know, you can turn on YouTube or you will find a million business authors yelling at you, you know, never give up 24 seven, keep up the hustle. How about take a nap? You know, how about take a fucking break? And I think there's tremendous value when you're getting rejected, when you're getting your, you know, just, life is just handing it to you. Taking the afternoon off sometimes is the thing that keeps your mission going. Whether it's having a bowl of ice cream, going on a bike ride, or even just turning off your phone for an hour. The wor you know, yes, it's not good to just waste time, right. but the worst thing is to give up altogether. And sometimes taking a short break sure. is the key to g keep going. Yeah, and that helps you be more productive because yeah. you've rested. Um, who do you wish you would have gotten to? You didn't, you didn't interview Sergey mm. or Larry. I'm sure you have a long, long list. There's, the, there's that funny, there's the cam Larry has the cameo in the yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird cameo, but it's <laughs> Read it and find out. One of the, it's another bathroom story. Uh, <laughs> one of the people who I, I do wish I could have talked to or hopefully I can talk to in the future is Barack Obama. And, you know, of course, I've admired his leadership abilities and his political savvy and his public service over the years. Um, but it wasn't until about a year ago when my dad passed away. You know, when a parent passes away, you sort of find yourself in this, this hole where you don't even know what's up and what's down. And I remember the first week after my dad passed, you know, right when it happens, it, your, your life is sort of filled up with the funeral and the memorial and the shiva. And when that stuff ends, you're just left with grief and no one, no one is around you. And it's, I still can remember that, that feeling and I remember waking up one morning not knowing what I was going to do because I took a little time off from writing and I saw this book on my shelf, Dreams from My Father by Barack Obama. And I'd never read it before and just because of the title, I ended up reaching for it. And I spent that whole day reading that book and crying and reading about how he lost his father made me feel less alone. And if I do have a chance one day to interview him, that's what I want to talk about. That's awesome. I think yeah. that that, um, like you've done with so many of these interviews, finding something specific that has not been talked about before is such an important angle. I think that's, um, that's an, awesome, an awesome goal. So I hope you get there. I hear he'll... Uh, I'll be back in Chicago soon, I hope. Um, so 
you've interviewed you've interviewed some really really famous people. You interviewed some sort of lesser known but really important business people like Key. You talk about Key Time from Microsoft. Um, do you think there's sort of lessons all over the board, all the way from you know Lady Gaga who has you know infinite sort of fame to um, some of these executives who are famous but not in the public eye? And so what's the difference there in terms of interviewing someone who's a little bit less in the public eye? So. You know, you brought up Chilu, and, you know, sometimes I, like, my friends and I will joke, because, you know, we wrote this book, I wrote this book when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. We used to think of the book sometimes as, like, this Coachella lineup, or, you know, you have the big names at the top, yeah. and then you have the smaller names at the bottom, but it's the smaller names sometimes, the smaller bands that always blow you away at a music festival. And one of the people who you brought up, his name was Chilu, and he grew up in a... You know, no one, almost nobody knows his name. And he grew up in a rural village outside Shanghai, China, with no running water, no electricity. You know, people were so poor in his village that they walked around with deformities from malnutrition. And, you know, we think our education system's bad in America. In his village, for every 300 students, there was one school teacher. But she was very smart and worked really hard, and by age 27, you know, and made it to the university and was making the most money he's ever made, $7 a month. Fast forward 20 years later and he's a president of Microsoft. And it's one of the most remarkable stories in tech that you've never heard. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is exactly what you said, that while there's tremendous value, of course, in the Bill Gates and Lady Gaga's in the world, sometimes it's the chi Lu's that throw you back in your seat. And you know, wisdom exists anywhere where there's a good question. And if you're asking the right questions, and if you're curious, you'll find answers to things you didn't even know you needed. I agree with that. Um, so I'll try to ask a good question. So you talk about, <laughs> you talk about the third door, obviously, as a mindset. Um, there are people who we know have made it through the third door, Steven Spielberg, Lady mm. Gaga. Can this be applied to anyone, or is this just for gifted, extraordinary people? I believe that, like you said, the third door is a mindset, it's a framework. You know, all these books that offer you, you know, recipes or blueprints for success, I, I, I don't subscribe to, because I think everyone's life is different. But you can have a mindset that opens possibility. And what I've learned, is that the power of the third door framework is that it applies to anybody who wants it to apply to their life. So anybody who's going out to start something new, anybody who's trying to make a dream happen, whether it's career-wise or personal, whether you're trying to make new friends or find a spouse, or get a dream job, anybody out there who wants to make something happen and doesn't want to wait around and hope life's gonna hand you what you're expecting, the third door mindset is for you. Now the hard part that people don't talk about when it comes to the third door isn't actually the process of getting into the third door. The hard part is leaving the line for the first door. Mm. Because that's where you were placed when you were a kid, that's where you were raised, that's where you know, school has to function there. It would be chaos if kids were running around all day, you know, in high school. And in many times, you know, human beings have a natural desire for certainty and comfort. But what I've learned is that no one achieves a dream from the comfort of certainty. And that's the hardest part. I'm going to invite everyone to start lining up for questions. I have a few more, but I'd like to open it up. Um, if anyone has any questions, please line up at the two mics. Um, have you sort of heard from people who have been inspired by the book and have oh. gone through their own third doors? And do you have any specific stories that were yeah. that made you feel really good? So the best part of the book launch, by far, has been getting responses from readers. Um, like, even yesterday, I just spend, I spent a couple hours just reading different messages and. I can't not cry because in many ways 
this dream wasn't about this. Because this is just, you know, sheets of paper bound up with ink splashed on it. The whole point it's of this, nice, though. It's nice. <laughs> the whole point of this mission, though, was for that effect on the readers. And, you know, there's, there's been a lot of different responses. I, there's, a, there's a few that I'll never forget. One, one person was, you know, exactly 18 years old, freshman in college, and he wrote, and the fun part is, you know, sometimes you get messages as an author directly to you. And sometimes they just post it online not knowing you're going to read it. I like those, the ones they don't even know. Like, I'll spend a lot of time on Google, like on the 23rd page of Google. You know, the 23rd O is my favorite O. That's where the interesting stuff happens on the Internet. And there was this one kid who wrote, reading this book felt like meeting the best friend I always wished I had. Aw, are you going to meet him? I, I tracked him down. <laughs> this is like a 19-year-old kid in his dorm room, and I, I tracked him Maybe down. Maybe that's your him. mentee. I, you know, his name is Connor. I reached out to him. I wrote him this long message, and that really touched me. And last, so that, I read that one a month ago, and last night I read one that was really powerful. Um, it was from a, a woman who, she wrote me, and explained that she was in an abusive marriage and she ended up escaping from her husband when her two kids were infants. Mm. And she wrote that reading the third door felt like the universe was giving her exactly what she needed and it brought her to tears. And the reason that one touched me so deeply is Truthfully, I wrote the book for Connor, for the 19-year-old, for the because that, that was the struggle I was going through. And to hear last night that it was helping people who are suffering from something I can't even imagine just was fulfilling in a way that's hard to explain. Please. I don't really know how to segue from that one. Um, <laughs> so I haven't finished the book yet, and you may have answered this, but um, the Barack Obama kind of the who you want to interview um, made me think, is there, out of all the list of people that you've wanted to interview, and you've done all this research, you get through the research, and you're like, I don't really know what to ask them. I mean, has that happened? Like, First of all, what's your name? Jason. Everyone give Jason a round of applause. <laughs> give us a round of applause. So, Jason, that's actually the first time I've ever been asked that. And it's something I've thought about a lot. So I'm very impressed. It's a really good question. Um, Which is important to have a good question. <laughs> no, it was really good. When I hear a question that I've never been asked before, I'm very impressed because it's very insightful. And the answer is yes. There have been people who I've researched who I was like, fuck it, I'll say the name. It was Elon Musk. I was, you know, you're, you're writing a book on successful people. He's a natural person to float. Look, he's done remarkable things. I read his biography, I've watched his interviews, and I was like, he's done a pretty good job. Yeah. You know, he, he's, he's sort of explained it, and I've learned that when it comes to getting these interviews for the book, I, I personally need to have this immense fire in my curiosity to get these interviews. Because it's not like I can just call up someone and get the interviews. So I need to be really passionate to make it happen. You know, for like you said, Lady Gaga, it took three years to make it happen. So with Elon Musk, I read it and I was like, you know, his biographer did a pretty good job. <laughs> you know, and I sort of just let it be. I like sent a message, but at that point, I sort of just let it be. That's a great question. You speak at a lot of corporations. We talked about that earlier. What do you tell people in corporate America? What's the message? You know, you're sitting at Google. What's the message for people at big companies? You know, how can we apply the third door mindset? So I've realized that when you're in a corporation, and it's been fun in the book tour because you sort of just get thrown across the spectrum of corporate America from IBM to Snapchat. You sort of see the whole the whole system. And what I've realized is that one of the biggest things that holds people back 
in their jobs, no matter what level they're at, and I've been hearing this from C-suite to the intern level, is there's a tremendous amount of fear. You know, fear for trying something new, fear for reaching for a new position, fear for, you know, sort of rocking the boat. And there's all these ideas that exist in the company, all this, you know, entrepreneurial energy that sort of gets tucked away. And, you know, one of the questions I can ask most is like, how do you become fearless? Like, that's like everyone's thing. They're like, how do you, how do you become fearless? And, you know, when I started this mission, I too was filled with tremendous amounts of fear. I was like the scaredest kid in the world. I had like a nightlight until I was 12. <laughs> you know, I was that kid. And what I've learned is that all the people who I interviewed, when they were starting out, were actually tremendously scared in the beginning. So it's not fearlessness that you should be looking for. It's courage. And the difference is incredibly important. You know, fearlessness is jumping off of the cliff and not thinking about it. You know, that's idiotic in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Courage, on the other hand, is acknowledging your fear, analyzing the consequences, and deciding you still care so much about it, you're gonna take one step forward anyway. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing I could share. And, oh, question. Uh, hi, um, so you talk about when you were at your low point and then you just kept going and eventually um, you succeeded. Um, but there are some times that the road is just not going anywhere and some projects are just going to fail. Mm. And then you just have to cut it at some point. And how do you tell the difference of the two? Like when do you decide, okay, this is just not going anywhere, I have to end it. And how do you decide like, okay, maybe this could succeed someday and then I'll just keep going. And my second question is, now that you have written the book, what's the next for you? And then what's your next goal? Great, what was your name? Uh, ZG. Everyone give her a round of applause. Give her so that's a, another great question because that's a big question I had. Because when I was just getting, you know, in that eight month rejection from Warren Buffett, when there was no hope in sight, the natural thought is at what point do you cut your losses? because there's some things that just don't work. So I ended up doing an interview with one of the greatest inventors alive today. His name is Dean Kamen. And Dean Kamen, you know, invented the Segway and the bionic pump and the, you know, I bought electric wheelchair and the insulin pump and the slingshot water purifier. And I'm sitting down with Dean Kamen, a guy who has 400 patents to his name. You know, Bill Gates goes to Dean Kamen for advice. Mm. And I'm sitting down with Dean Kamen and I had that exact question. At what point is it the right time to stop? Eight months, 10 months, you know, when do you stop? And he's like, he's like, you wanna know the answer? I'm like, yeah. And like, you know, he leans forward and he's holding this like dark cup of tea and he leans forward. He's like, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like I came all the way to New Hampshire to talk to the smartest guy on earth and you, your answer is I don't know? And you know, he leans back in his chair and he actually looks sort of sad. And he's like, you know, that's the thing that keeps me up at night the most. And you know, we ended up talking about this for a long time. And his answer was incredibly profound. But at the end, you know, I wanted something practical, something that I could almost use as a checklist. So when I'm in that situation, I can refer back to. So I sort of kept prodding him until he came up with this checklist of three things to ask yourself. When you feel you're at your, the end of the rope and there's no hope in sight, these are three things you can ask yourself to decide whether it's time to give up or if you should keep going. And these are the three things. The first thing is, you know, and he's a mechanical engineer. So his first piece of advice was go back to first principles. Ask yourself, is it physically impossible for this thing to work? Does it defy the laws of Newtonian physics, the laws of thermodynamics? Try to prove to yourself it's impossible. 
you know, let's say I wanted to interview Gandhi. You know, the laws of, you know, physics and biology say it's impossible. So ask yourself that. But for me, with Warren Buffett, you know, he does interviews with people all the time. So, you know, that one didn't work. So he gave me a second thing. He said, the second thing you should ask yourself is before you go and try it 150 different times, take a step back and look at all the different kinds of solutions. Because what you'll realize is, you know, although some people say persistence is the key and, you know, just use brute force. Dean Kane was like, brute force is for brutes. You know, it's not the best strategy. So if you step back, instead of banging on one door a hundred times, look at the different kinds of doors. Okay, we can try the kitchen. We can try talking to the bouncer. We can try the window. And then try one of each. And before you go knocking on one a hundred times, try one of each and see if you can make any progress there. So that was the second piece of advice. And his third was the most interesting, in my opinion. He told me a story of the STEM crisis in America, you know, the science and technology problem. And when it came to education, a decade ago, people were thinking this as a natural education crisis, where, you know, the answer was, let's hire more teachers, update curriculum, but still, we weren't making the progress we needed to make. So Dean came and thought, what if this isn't an education problem? What if this is a culture problem? And as soon as he reframed the question, new answers began to appear. And he created a thing called First Robotics, where he created this program where scientists became celebrities, Engineering became a sport, and it became this phenomenon having impacted millions of students across America. Engineers are cool. Engineers are cool, and they are, you know? And what Dean came and said is that the third thing on the checklist is sometimes the most important, where it's if you reframe the problem, sometimes that opens you up to new kinds of solutions. So those are three things I could give you. Do we have any other questions right now? If not, I have questions. Oh, we do. And really bring the heat. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll try to. Uh, so, I mean, I, I was just curious, uh, like, in all the interviews that you've done, uh, were there um, any th sort of themes that you might have observed, but, you, but then you thought, like, maybe it's just me thinking, and I didn't want to write about that in the book. So I'm curious about like, things like that, that you thought it may be a theme, but it might not be, so you, in the end you decided to not write about them? Like people who I interviewed who I ended up not writing about? Uh, not people, but I mean, say, let's say, uh, I mean, and for disclosure, I haven't read the book. Uh, I just yeah. have it just from the talk. But I mean, like, are, are there any themes that you observed and the people that you interviewed uh, that you're sure of that's a trend or maybe just that's uh, maybe some eccentricity of maybe a few people that you thought, okay, may maybe it's not a trend. And so, I mean, hmm. you can't aggregate that to like some uh, some data point, right? But at the same time, it was on the back of my mind, like, could that be possible that somebody who was successful uh, might also have this sort of uh, an attribute? So I'm, I'm just curious. The answer could be no as well, I mean. Yeah, when it came to, you know, different trends and different teams of people that I looked at, the good thing about this book is that, you know, you naturally... It, it had its own filtration process that I didn't even know about. Where, you know, the people who might, and you talked about this in the beginning, the Dream University. So the way the list of people came about, the people who I set out to interview. You know, when I started the book, you know, I, got, I won the prices right, got the, got the money from the sailboat. And I asked myself, all right, who are the most successful people? And, you know, I don't really believe in that whole Forbes algorithm of, you know, I don't believe you can have an algorithm for success. So I called my best friends and I told them to come over one night. And I said, guys, if we can make our dream university, who would be our professors? And they started, you know, shouting out answers. You know, Bill Gates would teach business. You know, Steve Wozniak would teach computer science. Buffett would teach finance. And that went on. And that's what created our list. And what I've noticed about that list is that you know, there are successful people out there, 
that weren't on that list. And when I look back at it, the people we were curious about were the ones who weren't, you know, handed, you know, weren't handed it from the beginning. You know, they weren't inherit, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that, working in a family business or doing something like that, but we were interested in someone who had to start something, you know, Peter Thiel calls it zero to one. The people who went from zero to one. And during all the interviews, what I've realized is there was a ton of different tactics they used, and I actually included them all in the book, but the overall themes were the same. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I wanted to follow up on a question that was asked earlier. Um, what is next for you? Is there a, a burning question that you have or a new idea that you want to pursue? So what's next? So I've been working on this for seven years. And you know, seven years went into it, and I'm one month out of it. So it's still very new. What I've realized, though, is you know, I heard this story Somewhere in my research, I can't even remember where I read it, but it's the story of a teacher who was teaching for Teach for America. And she was teaching at a school in Baltimore. You know, it was a really rough neighborhood, a really tough school. And she's teaching about, you know, I think a third grade class. She realized, all right, these kids need some inspiration. So she's like, all right, today, instead of doing, you know, our math exercise, I'm gonna pass out sheets of paper and everyone's gonna draw a picture of the thing you wanna be when you grow up. So you know, she passed out the paper and all the kids are trying and there was this one boy sitting in the back of the class who wouldn't pick up a crayon. The teacher was concerned and he had a sad look on his face. But about halfway through, his eyes light up and he starts trying. And at the end of the class, the teacher collects all the papers and the kids go home. She's going through them and she sees that kid had drew a picture of a pizza delivery man. And she was concerned, so she called the mother that night. And the mother said she wasn't surprised. She said that the only male figure in his life who's not in jail or on drugs is his uncle who delivers pizza. And what that story taught me is that young people will always reach for the highest branch they see as possible. Mm. So it's our job, whether it's schools or families or the media or technology, to illuminate more branches. And that's the mission moving forward. You know, as the book evolves, you know, we're on, you know, month one, month two of this mission. As it evolves, what I'm committed to is illuminating more branches. That's amazing. Well. You have an amazing memory, and the book's great. Let's give you a big round of applause for being here. Thank you. Everybody, please go out, buy The Third Door. It's a phenomenal read. You won't regret it. Thanks so much.